And so you've got one person stealing stuff from a CVS, two people stealing it from a Walgreens, 80 people running out of a Nordstrom's, you've got smash and grab robberies, and you've got the idea that people can just go ahead and commit crimes of higher and higher degrees because there's no consequences. Because society has sent a message that crime, certain crimes, and then maybe all crimes, may not have consequences. So I believe that, if, again, if you create a spiral of lawlessness, you are going down the wrong path. I would do my best from day one to create a spiral of lawfulness, that crimes actually do have consequences, measured consequences, balanced uh, consequences that are measured against the individual who committed the crime and the crime that they committed. Thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. So uh, before we get into the hard-hitting policy questions, I just had a few questions just to get to know you, understand where you're coming from. Um, could you talk about a political issue that you've changed your mind about at some point in your life? Huh. That's actually, it's a great question. A political issue that I've changed my mind, probably about mandatory minimum sentences. Uh, when I uh, came out of a judicial clerkship, uh, I went right to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I was 26 years old. And they entrusted me as an assistant U.S. Attorney with representing the United States of America uh, and figuring out um, where justice lay in certain cases. And the first year in the office, um, they give you the whole gamut of cases. And in particular, back then, this is 1990, um, drug trafficking cases. And so one of the cases I had, uh, amongst the cases I had to do were crack cocaine cases. And if you remember back then, they had, the, the, the law came down that said five grams of raw cocaine was the equivalent of 50 grams of powder cocaine. So if someone went ahead and trafficked five grams of raw cocaine, they could be triggering a 10-year mandatory minimum. No matter where they were, uh, in, the, in the food chain. They could be the lowest you know, dealer out on the street up to you know, some uh, high level kingpin, but you're going to get a minimum of 10 year mandatory minimum. And so I was in court more than once um, where people went to trial and, and lost because the evidence showed that they committed the crime. It was a relatively small amount of rock cocaine, uh, uh, crack cocaine, and um, and the judge and myself were fairly powerless. You know, the defense attorney would often come up with whatever arguments to, to, um, to get less than 10 years for their clients. And their clients could be in the early 20s. They might be uh, single parents, um, you know, with, with not much uh, involvement other than they participated in a couple of these transactions. And then all of a sudden the judge was having to issue a 10-year sentence, and it's a federal sentence, so you're going to serve roughly 85% of that uh, in federal prison. That was harsh. You know, the, 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 the laws have since changed, and they come up with, well, they, they changed the, the, uh, the crack cocaine, they equalized the crack cocaine, the powder cocaine laws federally. Um, and, uh, and then they created the systems uh, within the sentencing guidelines where sometimes the mandatory minimums apply, sometimes they don't, sometimes there's escape relief valves for low-level participants. They built all that into the system pretty much after I, got, I, I left the system, or it was as I was leaving the system. So I reflect back on that, and I think that, that blanket policies uh, that result in mass incarceration, bad ideas. But blanket policies that we have today that result in people not being prosecuted to the full extent of the law who are truly violent and serious felons um, that, that pose um, public safety threats, also bad ideas. Where I come down is I, I call it the hard middle. You know, the hard middle is, an, an, is basically balancing the idea of who constitutes true public th safety threats and need to be in prison versus the people who can serve their debt to society in some other way, home detention, community service, diversion programs. Part of the advantage, I think, of the perspective that I bring to the task is that I've been on all sorts sides of the courtroom. I was a judge's clerk. 
I was a prosecutor. I was a U.S. Assistant Attorney General running the tax division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And I've also been a defense attorney for 20 years. I've asserted people's constitutional rights against government overreach in many, many cases. And so it brings, I bring a certain balanced perspective, at least I, I think it's balanced, uh, in the sense that um, you know, if you've just been a prosecutor your whole life, it's hard to see the world from a defense or a defendant's point of view. If you've only been a defense lawyer your whole life, uh, it's very hard to see it from a prosecutor's view. And if you've been neither, good luck in trying to figure out the criminal justice system in the state of California on the fly. It's a complicated system, and yet in spending years and years in the system make you much better prepared to make important decisions that will affect people's lives and, the, and basically the public safety of the state. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I want to touch on all those, those policy issues that you, you brought up. But first, um, you are born and raised in California. Yes. Uh, but you've also spent time in Washington, D.C., I think. Uh, I spent time in Washington, D.C. I've spent time in Providence, Rhode Island. I went okay. to Brown University. I've spent time in, in London. I went to the London School of Economics. I spent time in Tokyo. I went to Tokyo University for a summer. And then I've been fortunate enough to travel in probably four or five continents around the world. So you have this kind of outside perspective. I wonder, what do you think the rest of the country gets wrong about California? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, pe people associate, it depends on where you are in the spectrum. Uh, I've heard it said that there are more Republicans in California than any other state in the United States by, by sheer number. Uh, you know, people look at, at the state sometimes, again, in, in sort of a blanket way. Either we're the bluest state in the world, or I'm sure when, uh, you know, when Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon um, were popular, we're a red state. Um, you know, it's making these sort of assumptions about Californians. People come and they think, for instance, Californians aren't as, uh, they don't have a, a deep, rich appreciation for politics, for the arts, for uh, science, for nuances in life, you know, because they have the Hollywood image. But, you know, if you actually meet Californians, we are the most diverse, most incredible state Forget the state. I mean, we, we would be a, the fifth largest country by GMP, so I'll say even a, a small country in the entire world. I mean, the, and, I've, and, and one of the interesting um, and, and best parts of this campaign is I've gotten the opportunity to go up and down the state and speak to Californians from across the political divide, all races, you know, ethnicities, uh, religions, um, yeah, every classification that you can break down, I've had a chance to speak to someone. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating state. I mean, you, you would think you're, you're in a collection of European countries or the entire eastern seaboard. Throw in the south, the midwest, and the upper northwest, and it's all here in California. So the, the idea that we're one thing in California is the greatest um, misunderstanding of California that exists. So among those millions of Republicans in California, you are one. So why? You know, I, I, I hearken back to the, and the reason I became a Republican uh, are the values that the party espouses. You know, in, in the criminal justice world, it was always safety and security. You know, it was, but it wasn't, um, again, it wasn't blanket policies that were the most effective. It was the hard, individualized analysis of each and every case to determine where the public safety threats lie and, which, and where they don't. You know, we're, you know, it's the party of Lincoln. It's the party of Roosevelt, Teddy. Um, you know, it, it's the party of Ronald Reagan. You know, and, and the party, like any party, has, um, has issues with it. Uh, you know, and I viewed myself as someone who could work within the party, uh, who has, um, especially when it comes to the issues I'm uh, most concerned about for this race, safety and security, a party that, that backs what I've backed. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use a most ex the most recent example of criminal justice legislation, which was the First Step Act. You know, it came up in the uh, Trump administration. It was bipartisan. It was, it was espoused as much by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer as it was Jared Kushner and Donald Trump. Uh, it did a lot of smart things. You know, it focused on rehabilitation 
while for federal prisoners, it focused on reentry programs for federal prisoners, compassionate release for people who had served a significant portion of their time but were sick or elderly, uh, smart things, things that actually we should adopt here in the state of California. Uh, and, you know, it was passed in a Trump administration. Uh, but again, where, where, where we have focused on smart safety and security policy level decisions, that's where I think the Republicans have, have spent most of the time going back to Lincoln in doing. What's your feeling about the state of the party right now? Because obviously one of your rivals in this race left the party and is running as an independent over the state of the party. You remain a Republican, so I mean, why? You know, again, I think that the, uh, going back to your earlier question about misimpressions, you know, the notion that the Republican Party is a monolithic um, view is the same misunderstanding of what California is. Uh, that California is some monolithic, you know, one, one size fits all point of view. Uh, I believe that there is, uh, is on, the, on the issues that I am most focused on in safety and security, there's actually not a huge amount of division. I mean, there, there's certainly there's people who are pushing one set of policies rather than another. But on these issues, you know, the party is unified. And by the way, I believe that not just the party, <laughs> I actually believe that most Californians um, who are experiencing the safety and security concerns that have arisen with an explosion of violent and street crimes, homelessness at an all-time high, uh, fentanyl poisonings that are going to kill more Californians this year than probably COVID, that, you know, this isn't just a Republican level issue, uh, it's a Californian issue. And, but I believe in this respect that the Republican Party is in, in lockstep with the majority of Californians in viewing this as a serious problem and looking for serious solutions to solve it. I know you've been asked in the past and you, and you declined to answer, but did, did you vote for President Donald Trump? Again, I, I decline to answer that question. I, I would decline to answer the question on if I voted for any particular president. president. I've used someone's personal vote in an election is, is you know, it's one of the, it's your sacred fundamental rights. And so it's not something that I've revealed for the Trump election or for that matter, any election uh, before it, or even, well, I guess not after it. We haven't had after it, so before it. In this case though, you're seeking an office where your predecessor, if you won, your predecessor sued the Trump administration more than 100 times. Some of those cases are ongoing. You'd be taking them over. I think people would perhaps want to know, would you continue with those and things like that? So in this case, it seems like it's actually relevant. So why then not answer, given that it's going to affect potentially the job that you're seeking? Right? Certainly. So when people use Trump, People, Trump is a placeholder. He, Trump is a placeholder for a series of actions, policies, and statements. If there is a particular action, policy, and statement, particularly one that affects the California Attorney General's office, I'm more than happy to answer that question. But if you're asking me for a placeholder opinion, especially if it concerns whether or not I voted for it, I'm not, I'm a, I'm not willing to answer that question. A, Trump's not on the ballot. Uh, B, his actions, policies, and statements may be relevant to what uh, I would certainly be tasked with doing as a California Attorney General, and I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, and C, let me make it very clear what I view the job of the California Attorney General as. I am not a legislator. If I want to go ahead and legislate California policy, I'd run for the State Assembly or the State Senate or maybe even for the Governor. And people who want to use the California Attorney General's office to legislate, people who have no criminal uh, background, for instance, or law enforcement background, like our current Attorney General, uh, and want to uh, uh, learn on the job and pretend that they can understand what's going on with safety and security when you have no personal uh, experience, you know, they, they should go back to the legislature and legislate. I view the job of the California Attorney General as enforcing the laws and the books of the state of California full stop. Uh, if, if, you know, if I have a personal issue with some of those laws, then I shouldn't run for this office. If I, if I could not enforce the laws on the books of the state of California, because that is the job. 
And so again, if there is a particular law in the state of the books of California that's involved with some legislation, uh, or excuse me, some litigation, um, I'm, my job is to enforce the laws on the books of the state of California. That being said, if I all of a sudden determine, or, my, or the California Department of Justice determines that a particular law is unconstitutional under the California or federal constitution, or illegal in some ways, then obviously I would have to weigh in on the unconstitutionality or the illegality. But if it's just a policy difference between me and the law, again, I didn't sign up to, to make the law, I signed up to enforce it. Okay, well let's talk about policy then. Um, so obviously there's growing public concern about crime, safety and security. So can you just talk about two initiatives um, that you would prioritize to address that? Certainly. So violent and street crime um, arguably have exploded over the last number of years. Uh, you can, to the extent that, uh, that we, we would need to do a whole variety of things to deal with that, I would do it, deal with it on day one. Let me give you a couple examples. You know, we've got this whole issue of people being able to steal $950 or less uh, and walk out of stores, small businesses, restaurants, and not being prosecuted. I just, I, I believe fundamentally that crimes have consequences or should have consequences. It doesn't mean, by the way, that everybody needs to be thrown in jail for hundreds of years and lock away, you know, and throw the key away. But crimes have to have consequences because if you don't have consequences if you violate our laws in society, you create what I consider to be a spiral of lawlessness. And society starts going down this spiral. And so you've got one person stealing stuff from a CVS, two people stealing it from a Walgreens, 80 people running out of a Nordstrom's, you've got smash and grab robberies, and you've got the idea that people can just go ahead and commit crimes of higher and higher degrees because there's no consequences. Because society has sent a message that crime, certain crimes, and then maybe all crimes, may not have consequences. So I believe that, if, again, if you create a spiral of lawlessness, you are going down the wrong path. I would do my best from day one to create a spiral of lawfulness, that crimes actually do have consequences, measured consequences, balanced uh, consequences that are measured against the individual who committed the crime and the crime that they committed. That's what I deal with every single day when I represent people in court who've committed crimes or when I used to prosecute those people who've committed crimes. It's hard work, by the way, to actually do the individual um, analysis of a particular person and where they fit. That's hard work, and you gotta be pretty darn experienced to do that kind of work. I have that experience. The people I would hire, hopefully, would bring that experience uh, you know, to bear. So I would certainly deal with that. Two other big issues that I would make, huge issues. Um, fentanyl poisoning. The fact that the current uh, California Attorney General doesn't have a, a weekly press conference screaming from the roofs about fentanyl poisoning is an absolute tragedy and an embarrassment, and I'll tell you why. They estimate that about 50,000 Californians, um, excuse me, 50,000 people nationally, 6,000 Californians will die this year from fentanyl poisoning. As you probably know, fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin, 100 times more powerful than morphine, two milligrams will kill you in two minutes. This is not about getting high. This is about a poison being introduced into uh, fake pills, uh, everything from marijuana, heroin, uh, methamphetamine. It is killing people unknow unknowingly, which is why it's poisoning. It's not overdoses, it's poisoning, because most of the people who are dying from this don't know that they just ingested fentanyl because the drug dealers, and again, the DEA, and this is Joe Biden's DEA, has said that the ingredients are coming from China, they're going to Mexican drug lords and coming over the southern border. Millions of tablets, uh, whether it's an Oxycontin, an Adderall, a Vicodin, a Xanax, are coming over the southern border as counterfeit tablets being sold on you know, social media like Snapchat to young people uh, you know, in their teens, in their 20s, in their 30s, and they're dying. 17 people will die today on average. Where else can you say that on a preventable crime? We're not talking about some health disease that may or may not be preventable. 
This is preventable. And 17 people are going to die today on average. So what is the California Attorney General, what is Rob Bonta doing about this? Crickets. Nothing. In fact, all the good work that's being done in the state is being done either at the district attorney level, We've got the Riverside District Attorney as an example, Mike Hestron, or the feds, the U.S. Attorney. They're the ones dealing with it. And when the California State Legislature had a chance to do something about it with SB 350, which was the, uh, the bill that was brought before them to give a notice to convicted fentanyl dealers, that if they go ahead and commit the crime again and someone dies, they could be charged with murder, the California Public Safety Committee killed the bill. By the way, what I did after that happened is I wrote a letter to all 58 district attorneys because I told the district attorneys that even though the bill's killed, you can go ahead and as part of a plea agreement, which is 90% of the cases, you can insist on this admonition or else there's no plea deal. Ten of the 58 district attorneys have taken me up on this idea and instituted this in their jurisdictions. And by the way, if I can do that as a private citizen, if you give me the power, the California Attorney General's office to do it, we will go after the fentanyl dealers across the board. And we will couple this with a very robust educational effort to make sure that, that basically middle school and high schoolers who have no idea that they are playing a bad game of Russian roulette. And when I say Russian roulette, I mean worse odds than putting a bullet in a six shooter. That's one in six. The DEA estimates four in 10 of these pills are laced with a lethal dose of fentanyl. So you are literally playing Russian roulette if you take one of these fake pills uh, in a way that's even more, uh, the, the game's more rigged against you that you're going to die than if you did it with a six shooter. So um, if we can clarify something here. So you, know, you, you made clear that you think the Attorney General should enforce the laws on the books. On yes. They're unconstitutional and should not be involved necessarily in making policy. But it sounds like, for instance, that you want to repeal Prop 47, which is something approved by the voters as a policy, right? So how do you reconcile that? Fair enough. So again, as long as Prop 47 is on the books, I'm enforcing Prop 47. By the way, Proposition 47 allows misdemeanors to be prosecuted. As you're probably aware, in, Cal in two of our major cities, Los Angeles and San Francisco, the DAs have come up with a blanket policy saying that they will not prosecute and decline to prosecute misdemeanors of property crimes, which again, when the, the limit was 400 or less, so be it. Now it's $950 or less. And what happens is, again, back to your spiral of lawlessness, is that once the police officers realize that if they brought in someone who's committed a misdemeanor, the DA is going to decline the case, they're thinking, should I do all the paperwork to do this if the case is going to be declined, or should I just not even bother to show up? Uh, or bother to arrest the person or file the paperwork. And guess what's happening? They're not coming. The police aren't coming. And guess what's then happening? The store owners know that. So the store owners are going ahead and watching people steal under $950, and guess what they're not doing? They're not calling the police because they know the police will do nothing about it. So when you hear about certain numbers, and the numbers basically say that, that shoplifting and, cer and certain property crimes have gone up in 2021. Those numbers are, are vastly underrepresentative of what's actually happening because those numbers require someone to actually call the police to file a police claim. And most of these claims are just going unrecognized. Un, uh, I shouldn't say most, a good chunk of these claims exist uh, and are not being brought to the police's attention, so the numbers are actually underrepresentative of what's going on. Now, to the extent that there are bills in the state legislature, one I know that a Democrat is, is propounding, one on the Republican side, that want to make changes to Proposition 47, whether it's changing back the limits to $400 for a felony, whether it's creating a new crime, like a serial felony, a serial crime, where in other words, if you commit three of these in a month, it becomes, on the third one, it becomes a felony, which is now a new crime that the state legislature could pass. Uh, I, I, in, in the capacity of the state attorney general, you can weigh in on that, uh, and you can say that I think that that particular uh, idea is an idea that is a, uh, it makes sense for the safety and security of Californians. But as long as the law is the law, you're not gonna be able to enforce 
a felony prosecution if someone steals $949, no matter how much you would like to do that. So we're sitting a couple blocks from a mass shooting just a couple days ago. Um, as Attorney General, how would you respond to that? Again, uh, the, the mass shooting here was, was an absolute tragedy. You know, uh, part of what you'd have to do with this particular mass shooting, as any mass shooting, is figure out how it came about um, in order to figure out then how to prevent it. So if it turns out that there were, you know, first they estimated there were, uh, well, they know that there was over 100 bullets that were fired. Was it fired by one person with an automatic rifle, five people, ten people? You got to figure out who was firing it. Then you got to figure out, well, why, how did they get in the position to fire it? We know that at least one person who's been arrested, a gentleman named Smiley Martin, um, was released uh, on a 10-year sentence that he got in 2018. He's released in February of 2022. Was that release appropriate? Were there things that could have been done to either prevent that release so he doesn't show up that day uh, at all uh, or not? If it means that, for instance, that the, the, the case that got him in jail uh, back in 2018 if that case was pled down from a, a more serious felony to a less serious felony, you know, we would take a lesson from that, that the, the Smiley Martins of the world were, are situations where if you have to go to trial to prove the more serious offense, you go to trial because you don't want the Smiley Martins to get out four years later or, or less than four years later to then be on the street possessing firearms and, and being part of, at some level, we don't know yet, uh, what happened. So again, what you would do is you do the hard work. You do the analysis to figure out where the weak points were in the system. If it turns out that stolen guns uh, were all over the place, and I don't know. I mean, they've, they've talked about one or two stolen guns. Uh, but if it turns out they're stolen guns, ghost guns, um, guns that shouldn't actually have been there, and you track them down, then you would go after the people who were or basically either stealing the guns or distributing those guns to people who were prohibited from having them. Is there anything the Attorney General could or should do? Uh, uh, along with what I just said, depending on what it turns out to be, it could be a ton of things. So for instance, the Attorney General has had a program to recover guns from prohibited persons for a long time. They recently, I believe, you know, talked about 150 guns that they recovered. 150 guns for the state of California and you're boasting about it? That's a joke. You know, that, that, that program has received millions of dollars of financing across the state. And if they really went after the guns that are being held by prohibited people, it wouldn't be 50, 150, it'd be 1,500, 15,000, maybe even multiples of that. And if it turns out that, a, that some or a lot of those guns were there that day in Sacramento, then that would be a way to go after the problem that the Attorney General would be right in, in, on ground zero to implement on day one. How do you think the Sacramento DA, your rival, has responded to the shooting? To the shooting itself? I think, again, uh, she both issued a letter, uh, dealing with Smiley Martin, we know that she issued a letter to the Board of Parole uh, that he shouldn't get parole. Turns out he actually uh, didn't get parole. The parole board actually uh, rejected his bid for parole. He got out on probation. Uh, and he got out early for reasons I don't, we're, we're, for reasons we're trying to understand. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, her going ahead and making sure that she analyzes all the evidence and figures out who's responsible rather than jumping to any particular conclusion of who's responsible, that's the way a prosecutor should proceed. You do not want to have a prosecutor going out in the media and start throwing allegations against people uh, if those allegations are not grounded in the evidence. You know, and, and quite candidly, one of the things I like about being a lawyer, have always liked about being a lawyer, is that you go ahead and you, you start with a body of law and then you go out and find the evidence. You apply the evidence against the law and you see where it takes you. Prosecutors who proceed that way are doing society a great service. Prosecutors who jump the gun and just start making uh, statements that aren't backed by the evidence are not doing the society a great service. So we have a lot of topics to try to get to in our limited time. So Ben, do you want to move on to the next one? Oh, I have less follow up. Hi, sorry, disinvited. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you. Two quick things, one follow up. Did you see that more people are going to die in California this year from fentanyl than from COVID? What I said is that it's very likely, 
and depends probably on the city, uh, that there will be more people dying from fentanyl poisoning. They average, they, they estimate based on last year's um, figures that there could be upwards in north of 6,000 Californians this year, which works out to about 17 people a day. Whether or not COVID, again, comes back in any significant form for the rest of the year, we don't know. But uh, if COVID stabilizes, uh, uh, or the deaths from COVID stabilize if, as they have, then there's a very decent chance uh, that in certain cities, and San Francisco being my, you know, the, the example that's gotten the most amount of press, I believe that the media in San Francisco highlighted the fact that in 2021, three times the number of people died from fentanyl poisonings than died from COVID. So while it might not be true, I believe, yeah, I believe that, that that was the number that the San Francisco Chronicle repeated several times. So again, while, while in a particular city, there might be more COVID deaths or even portions of city, in the aggregate, if you have 6,000 deaths from fentanyl poisoning, assuming again that the, the trend lines don't go up with fentanyl poisoning, and what we have seen in the last, since 2017, is that every year there are more fentanyl poisonings than the prior year by a substantial amount. I'm sure you're aware that prior to 2017 in California, fentanyl almost didn't exist. And just, uh, just one more off this mile of uh, issue. The folks, at least on the right, are trying to sort of tie this to these broadly decarceral strategies that Sarah had, that Bonds is continuing to do since endorsed. Are you connecting those policies with generally lower sentences, getting people out earlier, increasing credits for good time in prison with, with his release? I, I just want to be super clear on, on, on where you've been how you see the connection there. Certainly. So I think that to the extent that uh, the attorney general or the governor or even prior attorney generals have engaged in blanket policies that basically say that we're not going to take into account the actual individual that's involved uh, in the crime. We're not going to take it into account, for that matter, even the crimes that have been committed and how either um, whatever the aggravating or the mitigating factors are of those crimes. We're going to treat everything the same. And then we're going to let violent and serious felons out early, or we decide not to charge certain enhancements, whether it's gang enhancements, gun enhancements, other types of enhancements. I think those blanket policies are dead wrong, 100% dead wrong because they avoid the hard work of actually doing an individualized assessment of whether a particular person constitutes a public safety threat or doesn't. And if they do, at what level? Uh, and if there's some other mitigation strategy, you know, what it would look like. That's the problem with blanket policies, on both sides, by the way. That's why I'm running on what I've called the hard middle. The hard middle is hard. It requires a lot of work. You know, it doesn't let you, let you off easy uh, by just saying, okay, we're just going to let them out and hope things work for the best. Or we're going to put them in jail forever and hope things work the best. The hard middle means you've got to do the work. And that's where I come down. Um, state law now requires the Attorney General's Office to investigate if a police officer kills an unarmed civilian. I wonder what you, your thoughts are on that law and how it's been implemented, whether you'd see any changes to either the law itself or to the way it's being approached by the AD Certainly. So I, having talked to police chiefs and sheriffs up and down this state, um, I haven't met one that doesn't say to me that if we had more money to hire better, train better, and supervise better, we could deliver a better product, particularly in a, in a situation where the police are being asked to do more and more roles in society. Does it mean that, that, they, and that there are not problems in every single police force or sheriff's department? Yes, there are certainly problems. If, there, if, the, if, the service, if the force is big enough, almost with any organization, you're going to find problems. And if people have crossed the lines, and I'm talking about you know, the lines of, of where the, the, the law says you should not cross the lines, then whether they are um, <laughs> police officers or not, they need to have a reckoning. Uh, it, whether it's a criminal reckoning, a civil reckoning, uh, a combination thereof. But do you think it's appropriate for the AG's office to be investigating versus a local DA? I think it's both. I think that, that is, to the extent that the AG's office works with the locals, I think that is your most effective way to get out the correct answer. So for instance, in almost any police shooting, and this is what we're talking about, you're not, here's, the, here's the entities that are going to get involved in your typical police shooting. 
you almost always have an internal affairs division within the police departments. So they're going to do their investigation. Uh, you'll have a district attorney's office. Um, almost always it's a district attorney rather than a city's attorney's office that'll do their investigation. They may or may not use a grand jury to help and conduct that investigation. Uh, depending on the case, you might even have federal involvement. Uh, my example when I, in the, you know, when I was a federal prosecutor is that I was one of the prosecutors who prosecuted the major sheriff elite unit in the 1990s in Los Angeles that went ahead and stole money from drug dealers and stole their drugs and sold them. And we went after over 15 sheriffs or deputy sheriffs at that time and convicted them all. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a message that we sent out at the federal government level. We worked with our state counterparts to say, look, if you break the law, you can't hide behind the badge in breaking the law. So I think that, it, so then once you, to go back to the process, you got internal affairs division, you got a district attorney's office, uh, you got a potentially a grand jury. Sometimes there's even police commissions within certain cities that'll have their own separate investigation. Sometimes they have inspector generals that will also be looking at what's going on. You've got the feds in the U.S. Attorney's Office that usually would bring in the FBI at that point. And now you're adding one more later, the State Attorney General's Office. If the State Attorney General's Office works with the other entities that have done these investigations, again, to review it, to make sure it's been done proper, if there's anything that's been missed, to make sure that those uh, bases are covered as well, then eventually you'll get to a, to a point where you'll come up with a conclusion that everyone can back uh, because it'll be, again be based on the evidence and not just some speculation as to what can happen. These are very difficult cases in all situations. They involve the emotions run incredibly high on all, on all levels. On the one hand, you know, if you come down and you find that a particular officer should be prosecuted, you're going to, you know, it'll affect the police force, obviously that officer's life. If, you turn out, if it turns out that you decide that that officer should not be prosecuted, you've got a whole set of victims in a community that you've got to explain that decision to. These are very tough cases. If the state attorney general comes in like a cowboy and decides I'm just gonna do this myself and not cooperate or work with anybody else, it's a bad way to, to deal with this situation. Quite honestly, it's a bad way to deal with any situation. State law does require the AG's office to take that, that lead authority. And so do you have any objections to that? That law lead the law, no. Lead authority, no. But it does not say that you, you work to the exclusion of all the other entities that have, been, that have participated in this situation. In fact, it would be insane for you to avoid all the hours and the manpower, the brain power, the evidence, the trained investigators, uh, whether, again, it's, it's local investigators, federal investigators that have often been brought, particularly to the most contentious matters, uh, and then decide you're just somehow going to, to get, you know, do it yourself and do a better job than everybody else. But it, so many local prosecutors punt on investigating those cases themselves because they don't want the heat from their local communities. So I guess in, you know, that law emerged out of, you know, something that a lot of people wanted. Why do you think that, why do you see it as the AG coming in as a cowboy doing things on their own? Again, you, the, the assumption on, your, on what you just said is that all the processes that, that result in, a, in whatever result was failed. That, that's the assumption, that the Internal Affairs Division of the police failed, that the district attorney's office failed, that if they used a grand jury, it failed, that if it was serious enough that there would be a referral, uh, or even not a referral, the U.S. government can come in, they have jurisdiction over every case, that they decided not to come in, that they, they have failed as well. And I'm not saying that there aren't situations that probably fit that mold. I think they're fairly rare. But when they do fit that mold, then yes, the state attorney general comes in, leads the investigation, sees what's been done, and as importantly, what hasn't been done. And if, they could, if, if a different determination needs to be made, because that's where the evidence takes you, then absolutely, that's the job of the state attorney general. What I'm saying is that when it, where it's done, <laughs> without consulting with other uh, uh, law enforcement entities that have already been involved. And again, you need to be experienced enough to know the difference between a good investigation and a not good investigation. 
Having done these investigations myself, on both sides, by the way, I've gone ahead and, and conducted these investigations as a prosecutor, and I've ripped these investigations apart as a defense lawyer. And I've been a victim's advocate as well, and also participated in the, in the investigations from the victim's side. Well, so Ben, let's move on to the next topic. We, need to Certainly. we have a lot more uh, issues to get to here, if you don't mind. Do you support the death penalty in California? Uh, I say, again, my, my default argument will always be, on every issue you're going to ask me, that as the California Attorney General, I will, I will enforce the laws on the books of the state of California. Uh, so to the extent that the death penalty is on the books of the law, uh, it's, on the, it's one of the laws on the books of the state of California, then I will enforce that uh, if the appropriate situation comes up. Would you support any changes to crimes that might qualify as a, as a, capital, as a capital crime? You know what, I haven't looked to see if there are any, I mean, obviously I know that the, the big crimes that, that qualify. If there are some crimes that somehow qualify that I haven't focused on, um, would I, if there was state legislation that was being considered to deal with it, would I come in and, uh, and take a position one way or the other? I would imagine I would take a position one way or the other if somehow I thought some crime that that used to be on the books 50 years ago is no longer meritorious of the death penalty. Uh, but again, while it's on the books of the laws of the state of California, my job is to enforce it. But do you believe in the death penalty? Do you believe we should have a death penalty in California? Well, I be what I believe, again, is, uh, is not important in the sense of carrying out the duties of the job of the California Attorney General's office. My personal belief one way or the other. As long as it's on the books, uh, of the, uh, the, the, it's one of the laws on the books of the state of California, I will carry it out. If, if and when the state legislature or the people decide to eliminate the death penalty in the state of California, then I will deal with it at that point. Either way, my, I'm signing up for a job that's enforcing the law, not making the law. But you just said that you'd be willing to weigh in on the legislation that they might consider over at the Capitol. Well, again, it, it, and, and that's true, because I think part of the job of the state attorney general on, on occasion is not to make the laws, but to the extent that they are asked, very often the state attorney general's office can be asked for its opinion on whether or not it believes a particular law is constitutional or not constitutional. That's more what I meant as far as weighing in as opposed to the policy decision on whether or not the law should go forward or not. Well, speaking of legislation, there's obviously a lot of discussion now about um, ways to change California's gun laws. Uh, there, there's legislation now that would give citizens the right to bring a private lawsuit against a manufacturer or vendor of a gun for violating a state statute. Do you have any thoughts on that? Again, my, my position on, on the gun laws in California, I think I read an article in Cal Matters maybe, that uh, there's 111 different gun, various gun control laws dealing with background checks, uh, who's prohibited from having a gun in this state, uh, limits on ammunition, limits on assault rifles. Um, you know, I think that, again, if my job would be to enforce these laws on the books. Uh, do we need some additional laws that are untested at this point? Again, I think that uh, the laws on the books, if properly enforced, would be the job for the California Attorney General. Uh, I'm, you know, those are the laws. Again, whether, whether I think there's too many laws, where instead of 111, we should have 11, or we should put a zero and have 1,110 laws. At the end of the day, that's for the California legislature to decide. It's ultimately for the governor to either sign into law or veto. And my job would be to enforce the laws on the, on, you know, the, the laws that are on the books of the state of California. I, I have a question about that. Yes. Um, so the AG would interpret a lot of these laws and come up with the policy or, or how they should be implemented. How would you do that differently from your, you know, your predecessor or, and or your, the people you're running against? Well, again, in, in, in if there is a, uh, a law that says that there are certain people who are prohibited from having a firearm, there's very little interpretation 
in a law like that. In fact, those are probably some of the most black and white laws that you can have. You know, if you have a felon, you're a felon and uh, if, if you have any type of felony that hasn't otherwise been uh, eliminated from your record and you possess a firearm knowingly, uh, you know, you're guilty of the crime, full stop. The, the gun can be seized, you can go to jail. It's not a lot of room for interpretation. There might be room for deciding where you prioritize going after prohibited people and you want to spend the resources of the California Attorney General's office on who you decide to, you know, uh, dedicate resources to. So if, for instance, rather than going after 150 guns, you want to go after 15,000 guns, you're going to need the financial resources to do it. You're going to need basically local and state resources, maybe even federal resources, to go into fairly sometimes dangerous areas to go get these guns. Uh, and if people who are prohibited are actually possessing them, then they get arrested as well. Specifically on that, is that something that you would propose to do and how would you gather those resources? Well, right now the California Department of Justice is allocated millions of dollars. In fact, the budget for going after these type of guns from prohibited persons has only gone up over the years. I'd spend the money. I'd spend the money wisely because the argument's a public safety argument. There, there, there's almost no one across the political spectrum who is defending the right of pro prohibited persons to possess guns. Literally, no one on the political spectrum. It's just not being done. Why? I have no idea. I have no idea why they're not spending every penny that they're getting for this purpose to go get the guns from prohibited persons. Could it have stopped the Sacramento shooting? Who knows? We, we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but would everyone across the polit political spectrum appreciate that prohibited persons no longer have a particular gun? Yes. So can I go back to that citizen law Certainly. question, just so I understand what you're saying? It sounded like you were saying the legislature should, legislature should figure that out, that you don't have a position on whether citizens should be able, able to have that ability. Well, again, it's... <laughs> Uh, the legislature ultimately will determine whether or not that is a, um, an additional gun law that California needs to have. Do you think citizens should be able to have that ability to sue gun manufacturers? You know, my, again, I'm going to go back to the, my overall position that on an issue like this, that, uh, uh, that the, whether or not a law actually comes to be is a decision of the state legislature and the governor, not myself. If they decide to bring a law, I will certainly deal with it to enforce it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not the position of the California Attorney General to decide whether or not that is a law that the legislature should adopt. So, Nigel, I think you have a bunch of questions that you want to uh, get to, so let's go to Great. Uh, thanks so much. Now you can talk to this body head fullback. Very good. Um, <clears throat> so, as you go to Baranda, um, your response is going to be that you want to follow the law as it's written, right? Uh, but obviously, as you know, and, and, and generally, prosecutorial discretion exists. Right? You can decide what to prosecute. What we have seen in California is a disinclination to prosecute some of the housing laws, especially when, when, when folks violate something like Marina. So when we look at housing laws, is that going to be a priority if you're elected? Uh, and what is, how do you think we should enforce SB 9, which is the new law that allows duplexes on single family lots? Great question. So, it, it, and it's a complicated question because of this fundamental fact. Uh, there isn't a city out there that actually builds. They don't build. There's not a city manager who build, who's ever built a unit. Well, unless they did it in their private capacity. Developers build. Pe people build. The city doesn't build. So the question then is, if you want certain additional units built, particularly low-income units, because we're not talking, I don't think your question deals with should we have more multi-million dollar houses built in California. Uh, that's not where SB9 is going. So to the extent that SB9 you know, affects certain neighborhoods for which the only answer would be you're going to split a lot and build more multi-million dollar houses, I don't think that's going to affect the, the housing supply uh, for low-income people or, or people who otherwise need houses. So you're dealing with certain cities that have been under certain mandates and certain quotas to build additional units. If, they are, if they're acting in good faith and you see that the cities have adopted plans 
uh, whether it's certain zoning plans, certain permit approval plans, and maybe it's not going as fast as we would otherwise hope, but the city explains that, look, you know, we have now adopted this, but the developers aren't coming in. Why? Because we have certain rent control issues or we have certain um, uh, you know, abilities to attract rent in a particular area and the developer doesn't see the economic incentive of building in our particular uh, jurisdiction. If the, if the Attorney General then comes in and says it doesn't look at the totality of the circumstances and does just a numerical analysis and says, okay, you were supposed to build a thousand units, you built 500, now I'm going to sanction you in some ways, or I'm going to come. Sure. But for the cities of Newport Beach and for Beverly Hills, they built two units or one unit in the entire last rate cycle. So how are you going to enforce the affordable housing laws and goals when they miss it by, you know, two versus what you're supposed to build is a thousand? Well, again, let's, you, know, you could take either one of those communities. Uh, let's take Beverly Hills as an example. Beverly Hills has plans to build hundreds of senior citizen units. Turns out that Beverly Hills actually has a need for senior citizen housing. If you look at the, um, the demographics in Beverly Hills, that's where one of the bigger needs is. They need to attract the funding, whether it's state funding, tax breaks, uh, or, or whatnot, they will attract developers to build the housing within those cities. To the extent that, they are, they, that their plans exist, and ironically, if you point out Beverly Hills, I'm aware that those plans do exist. And they've been negotiating with the California Attorney General's Office, amongst other people in the state, to explain to them the good faith efforts that they've taken to build those units. But they still need someone to actually build them and pay for them. Because right now, it's not like Beverly Hills has a fund of money where they can just start handing out tax breaks and property tax exemptions and whatnot to go ahead and, and have hundreds of units created. You know, again, so it, it's a complicated situation. The state attorney general certainly needs to do their job. And if their job is to make sure that cities are on track, ap op acting in good faith to get this done, then the state attorney general is doing his job. If, on the other hand, the state attorney general did nothing, they, clearly the, the job would not be performed. And if the state attorney general does the flip side, which is just do a numerical analysis and doesn't look at the actual efforts that a particular city has done, again, I would believe the state attorney general is not doing their job. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Somebody else? Oh. There we go. Thank you very much. Little mic issue. Sorry about that. So, so one that I mean. What I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that you're not talking so much about penalties as kind of getting them, helping the cities get into compliance. But SB9 does sort of ask me to do that. So what kind of penalties would you consider proposing for those violations? And I mean, once where you determine that there really is one, despite their plans and everything else. Again, you know, if you have to go to court, uh, you know, which is probably where you'd have to go to litigate with a particular city, uh, I would imagine that that situation would be pretty egregious that you, don't, you have a city that basically uh, has, has no good faith efforts um, being uh, instituted to comply with SB 9. Uh, if, a, if, if a situation existed like that and you had to take a city to court, you take them to court. There's penalties called for by SB 9. Those would be the penalties on the table. You take, again, it's an evidence-based decision. And you would take into account all the efforts that a city's been, you know, been instituted to comply with SB 9. But again, I wouldn't back off any particular city in this, in this state if, in fact, they've completely forsaken their duty to comply with a state law. But on the other hand, I will absolutely take into account uh, whatever good faith efforts they're willing to put on the table and certainly work with them to get to a point where they're in compliance with the law. I mean, I want to press on this a little bit more because this is not a hypothetical situation. There's literally dozens of cities across California right now that are passing ordinances to block SB9 from essentially having any impact in their community. That's just one law, but it's pretty illustrative of the approach that cities like Los Altos Hills or Redondo Beach or some of these other bad, you know, bad actors have taken on a lot of California laws. So this is like a pretty real thing that you're gonna have to be confronting. And I, I am really curious like how aggressive you would be in terms of looking at that and going after, you know, people who are 
trying to block state laws from having any impact in their community? So my track record when I was a prosecutor is uh, uh, that I don't back down from anyone. But my track record also was that I go out of my way to truly understand all the facts that are behind anything going on. And to the extent that you have the ability to negotiate with people and get them into compliance rather than having to bring a lawsuit, that's what you know, 20 years of civil litigation experience uh, has prepared me for. I've, I've done 20 years of appellate experience, not just the criminal side. And as you know, most civil litigation, which is what this would be, and again, to the, by the way, to the extent that people are running for the Attorney General's position and have no civil litigation experience, God help them on how they're going to deal with over half the job which involves civil litigation. But as you're probably aware, in civil litigation, a good chunk, if not most, of the cases are resolved prior to trial. Uh, many of them get resolved before you even institute the lawsuit. So it can start with a letter, which is what has been typical of the California Attorney General's office, that a letter is issued. And the letter can even come after informal attempts have been um, implemented to work with particular cities and deal with what the, at least the California Attorney General's office would consider to be uh, violations of SB 9. So if it's um, certain aspects that, that, that cities, you know, you call them obstructive moves, uh, if it truly is obstructive under the law, and you'll explain to them, look, here's the law, and here's how you will lose in court if we have to bring this. If you want to uh, test us, and the law is on our side, and the facts on our side, then we will bring the lawsuit. You know, and we will take it to as far as we need to do. But I would go out of my way, as I have for 20 years in civil, criminal, and appellate litigation, to see if we could actually resolve the case, rather than having to get to court. But having been a trial attorney, going to court is, is where I have spent a good chunk of my working days for the last 30 years. So I'm, not only am I not afraid to go to court, but the court, I've, I've been able to work within the court system to get resolutions of cases across the board. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next Hang question. Hang on, I just want to say, interrupt, because we're at, we're at an hour, and okay. uh, we obviously have some more questions. I just want to respect your time. Uh, I'm good for right now. Longer? Yes. Okay. So, go ahead. Right. So we're going to hit a couple uh, topics in pretty quick succession here. Um, Planned Parenthood estimates that about 3,000 uh, women um, get abortion in California from out of state every year. Should California become a sanctuary for abortion rights, and specifically to you, what role should the Attorney General play in that debate and issue? Sort of like with the, many of the other issues that you've raised today, the California Attorney General will enforce the laws on the books that the state legislature passes and the governor signs. So if they, you know, if they pass a law that deals with uh, this particular issue beyond what already exists on the books, again, if I didn't uh, want to enforce that law, I shouldn't run for California Attorney General. Jumping to online sports betting. Do you support online sports betting in the state? What about the out-of-state companies like FanDuel, DraftKings? What role would your office play in this? Uh, yes, I do support uh, online sports betting. Uh, I wrote an article in 1997 or 98 uh, in the Los Angeles Lawyer magazine, I believe, where I advocated back then that the government should regulate, license, and tax uh, online sports betting. I was a little ahead of my time. Uh, Supreme Court took another 20 years or so to get to where I was. Uh, because I believe that, that there's huge advantage. It's going to exist. It's a multi-billion multi dollar industry. And the only question was, are we going to regulate it and make sure that any bet, you know, we sort of like Las you know, Nevada regulates its casinos. They do their best job to do background checks and make sure that they're good actors acting legally in the system? Or are we going to license that and you can actually make money from the licenses and then tax it? You know, my, part of my background is as a tax attorney. There are billions of dollars that the state of California, and for that matter all the other states, are not receiving uh, because this uh, amount of money has never been truly taxed. And so I believe bringing this out into the open and having stuff that is otherwise going, a multi-billion dollar industry that's existed below ground, bring it above ground, 
let California be one of the leaders in this field, uh, properly regulated, properly licensed, properly taxed. Uh, there's also provisions that have been built into the law dealing with people who get addicted to online sports betting to make sure that, that proper resources are deployed to deal with people who will most likely, or some, some segment will get addicted to this. We have to deal with that. And by the way, that exists right now. And we're not dealing with it because it's all underground, at least certain portions of it. So yeah, I believe that if, if California can smartly get into the online sports betting business, it absolutely should. And, and just to clarify, uh, uh, what is the AG's role in that? I mean, I, we're talking about prosecuting and pushing the, the folks that are, that are doing underground betting now, or, or, or how would you? So, so if, if California, whether it's through proposition or through passing laws, gets into the online sports betting, uh, it becomes, you know, you, you enforce the compliance with the law, obviously, uh, amongst the people who are being licensed and regulated by it to make sure that you'll probably most likely work with a state division that'll be assigned to do with the, the sort of day-to-day -day compliance. And if people are out of compliance and it has to go to court, most likely the state attorney general's office would get involved at that part. To the extent that there's criminal violations uh, that might also exist for people who are now not complying with the law, now that the law is out there, most likely the state attorney general will play a role on the criminal side. Those are probably the two biggest roles that the state attorney general's office would play. Uh, in the pandemic, and we don't have the stats for 2021 yet, but we did see um, obviously violent crime go up. Another crime that we talk about less uh, is hate crimes among certain groups. Should a state enact additional hate crime procedure, or excuse me, should a state enact additional hate crime protections or increase the penalties we already have on the books? So I think enforcement, there, there, there's two aspects of hate crimes. And I've been, I've worked with the ADL um, on anti-Semitism for years. Uh, my, my father was one of the leaders in Los Angeles uh, as part of the ADL. Um, this issue is near and dear to my family and my heart, dealing with both anti-Semitism as it affects Jewish groups and discrimination as it affects everyone, every other groups in society. There's two aspects that have not been done well enough in our society. One is report, reporting up. Uh, there are certain jurisdictions in California that it, it, when it's been analyzed, um, it would seem like that there's never been a hate crime or there've been very few hate crimes in those jurisdictions. That is a function of reporting. Uh, the federal government, interestingly enough, uh, passed a, a law recently called the, I think it was called the No Hate Act um, and it provides for additional funding to, for law enforcement to go ahead and up its reporting uh, of hate crimes. And then, which in turn means you have to use both law enforcement and nonprofit and, and social service organizations to get the word out to society that if you are suffering from a hate crime or you've been a victim of it, please report it. And that's what hasn't been done. Because once you get a better idea of the scope of the hate crime, then you can actually see whether or not the prosecutions are sufficient enough to deal with the, that, that quantity of hate crime or greater efforts have to be put in. And then once you have that tracking down, you can see whether or not you need to actually increase the penalties in order to deter people engaged in hate crimes or whether or not the penalties are sufficient and you just haven't been prosecuting it enough. So that is sort of the levels of analysis you'd have to engage in to decide whether or not you need to up the amount of time in a particular hate crime, up the amount of prosecutions, or up the amount of reporting, or all of the above. All right, let's jump to internet, social media, and privacy. Um, most people, uh, tech companies are headquartered in California. Uh, should the Attorney General do more to protect privacy on the internet and most and more aggressively the California-based companies that are here. And tell me how you can do that if, if, if you were to take it out. Again, you're, you're picking out some excellent and complicated issues. Uh, I'm a big supporter of data privacy. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how California's um, sort of cutting edge laws that are gonna come really into play at the start of next year, January 2023. Uh, with consumer privacy will play out. 
I mean, we've seen a couple other states, I think Virginia and maybe one or two other states that are emulating California's laws. Uh, but California will have one of the strongest laws for consumer privacy, internet privacy as well, uh, on the books uh, that will be implemented, hopefully, when I'm the Attorney General and get the opportunity to be one of the leaders in the, in the country in implementing a law like that. I think you need to work with tech companies. You know, we are fortunate enough to be the birthplace of some of the biggest tech companies on planet Earth or in world history. Uh, we need to work with them. You know, the tech companies are not necessarily in any way our enemy. Um, and to the extent that they want to thrive, but in a, in a situation where they are working with uh, regulatory authorities as opposed to constantly against them, you know, again, I'll take their, their words at face value until proven differently. When they go to Congress, when they go to state legislatures, and they say, we want to work with you. Now, it certainly has not worked out that way in many situations, but I would look for every opportunity to work with the tech companies to come up with a regulatory structure that works for them and as, as or more importantly, works for the consumers of California. Can I have uh, one group of consumers that's been a point of focus is kids, right? Uh, there's a lot of medical evidence and there's some studies coming out now that says that social media affects uh, younger people and their self-image uh, in terms of doing self-harm, that it may be too much or too soon for certain groups. Is that your position? Do you think that? And would you actually work to regulate that? I've seen the studies. Uh, I don't know if the studies are conclusive, but I'll, I've certainly seen the studies that you reference uh, that kids can be negatively affected by uh, overusage of the internet uh, to the extent that that as a combination problem. In other words, if it involves kids, it most likely also involves parents and the ability for parents to control what their kids see. Uh, I know, for instance, I'll give you an example in the fentanyl issue to go back to one of our earlier issues. One of the big issues dealing with a, a company like Snapchat is that Snapchat refused, unlike Facebook, to allow parental controls to come on its platform so that parents could actually monitor whether or not their kids were chatting up a drug dealer or not. You know, you know there's, there's actually laws that are, that are being contemplated in this area of whether or not internet companies, and I'll use again this fentanyl issue, should allow this technology on their platform to allow parents to basically act as parents when it comes to their children's technology. I'm a big fan of that. I would want to in increase the technological tools that parents have to monitor their children's internet usage uh, at the highest level. Because I think that ultimately that you know, how a child is raised is, is a, 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 you know, the number one set of people who should be in charge of that are, your, are the parents. I have a political question for you. Uh, yes. Before, before you leave. So, as you probably know, uh, the state hasn't elected a Republican for statewide office since 2006. You um, are running in this race against another candidate, Anne Marie Schubert, who is making many of the same criticisms you're making of the current Attorney General, but doesn't have the R next to her name. So I wonder, are you concerned that that, that label, that partisan affiliation, might be a liability for you? You know, I think when it comes to safety and security, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, there were uh, a significant number of Republican attorney generals. Even with Democratic governors, there were Republican attorney generals. Because when the Republican attorney general candidate focused on safety and security, particularly pragmatic common sense solutions for safety and security, they won. I think that we're back to that issue. That up until very recently, the last couple of years, safety and security was not one of the foremost issues in voters' minds. In fact, 2014 was considered one of our safest years in the last 50 years. And when safety and security is not one of the issues, then voters often will tend to focus on something else. But now that we're in 2022 and safety and security is well on the, the is front and center of most voters' um, fundamental uh, uh, factors on what they're thinking about, I think they're, they're going to look beyond the party. Uh, they're, and they're going to look at the actual individual on who can get them to the, you know, to, to pro who can make their communities more safe and more secure. 
I think that they're also going to look uh, at a couple other things. The Attorney General's office, as we've been discussing, is more than just criminal prosecution. So I think what they're going to look at is, does someone actually have civil litigation, which is what the bulk of a California Attorney General is going to be involved with, experience? I do. Anne Marie Schubert doesn't. Appellate experience. You know, the California Attorney General is in charge of every appeal all the way through the California Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court. I have 20 plus years of appellate experience having personally argued over 30 appeals in federal courts across the country. Anne Marie Schubert doesn't have this experience. I think they'll also look at the, the party affiliation and when voters are looking at the ballot they're going to see party preference Republican and there I believe when it comes to safety and security that's not a negative that people will associate Republicans with a party that has traditionally promoted safety and security in a responsible way. And then they'll look at the other designation, party preference, no. And will the party of no, what does that actually stand for? Is it liberal? Is it conservative? Is it super liberal? Is it super conservative? Is it all the above or none of the same? And the party of no has no infrastructure it has no party, really, uh, and voters aren't going to necessarily know if you're the party of no, because uh, we don't. It won't say independent. It won't even say none. It'll say no. What the party of no stands for. Okay. Great. Well, that's it. well thank you. Thank you so much.